push. Does it want to? No. Push what? I don't know, because that doesn't seem to move anyway. Yeah. yeah. Just going now. Good morning. Can we have a seat, please? So good morning, friends, and welcome to the second day of our first World Scout Education Congress. Uh, I hope you have enjoyed the uh, last day's, uh, I mean, yesterday, um, sessions. I saw that you were really engaged in the session, which is excellent. And I hope that you have all had the opportunity to have some rest during the evening, because we'll have another full day today. Uh, I presume that you know me by now, but my script says that I need to introduce myself. So uh, my name is Jean Armand Gonçalves. I'm a member of the World Scout Committee. <laughs> uh, so the, the theme for today is education. After we look outside yesterday, try to find the uh, trends and the signs that we should be aware of, of what's going around us. Um, the second day is more focused on the, um, the mission of educate uh, young people, or to help young people to grow. Um, before we begin the session, uh, I would like to invite you to have a short meditation. on the screen. When a child is born, we do everything we can to protect them, nurture them, love them, a child's heart and mind are fragile. As they grow, we want to teach them everything we know. We send them to school to fill their minds with wonderful knowledge, to give them the tools they need for life. At school, they get a taste of what things are like in the world outside. There is friendship, romance, disappointment, embarrassment, discrimination, and bullying. But are the tools we give them enough to prepare them for this world? We have an enormous responsibility and an amazing opportunity. If we truly want to prepare them for the world outside, we must also educate the heart. Because to navigate the world outside with compassion, acceptance, and tolerance, we need to teach them compassion, acceptance, and tolerance. This can begin in our schools and it can start today. It can happen at hockey practice, dance class, at day camps and music lessons. And it's already happening around the world with astonishing results. If we want our children to grow into socially and emotionally capable young people, we must ask for a balanced education that puts importance on educating both the mind and the heart. Thank you. Now I would like to invite someone from the OAS committee to uh, give us a few practical announcements. Um, yep. Alex? Why are you laughing? Um, <laughs> Good morning, brothers and sisters. The Congress has already begun, and I have been instructed that scouting is a serious business. So I have been given a script to announce. I cannot make any announcement impromptu. Sorry, I'm getting old. OK, serious matter. The most important things for us is to welcome you 
and to make sure that you come to the Bain and Powell International House to attend the Congress. And that has been done, and has been done with flying color, I hope. So your departure is no longer a priority. And only one third of you have told us, when are you leaving Hong Kong? I personally can guarantee to the Director General of Immigration that all of you will pack up and go after the conference. <laughs> so please, for those who have not confirmed that your departure flight fill in this form, which is under your, the word I cannot say, <laughs> so fill it in and return to us as soon as possible, or else our duty is over. You will be on your own. Okay, thank you very much. And you will also, for those accompanied person, they will not have this form, but they can get it from the information counter. As at yesterday, I'm instructed to say only 150 of us had confirmed the reservation of the airport shuttle. So we have only bought 150 tickets and the train is quite full. So give us your details today. Okay. Uh, one form for one person only. And those who have already confirmed your reservations, you may go to the information counter to collect your message. And Ms. Carto, I have another script. You have taken it away. So what is the technical announcement for the other matters? I mean, is that in that seat? I'm not joking. I don't have it here. <laughs> as far as I can remember, there's a change of the room. <laughs> Going to, I'm not going to steal the show. <laughs> the prayer room is located on the eighth floor or the quiet room, 839, 809. And the opening hour is from half past eight in the morning to 11 at night. And as most of you have already been aware, there is a big mosque just left or right of this building. And you won't miss it in Kowloon Park. And for those who need the simultaneous interpretation equipment, you may borrow them by leaving your name tag, that is your bond, to the staff. Please rem be reminded that you have to return that at the close of the plenary sessions before you go out to the coffee break. Our scouts will be on duty at the gate to collect or to take away your machine if you have not handed it to us by then. There are pigeonholes outside on the left of this exit where you can leave information and collect your information. As far as I have been informed, the business is very low, so please make use of it. And finally, uh, under the request of the Friends of Scouting in Europe, there will be a drinking gathering at the Brown Sea Terrace of the Commissioners Club on the 8th floor when you at 18.45 hours, 6.45 at the Brown Sea Terrace. If you want to know where is Brown Sea Terrace, when you go to the 8th floor, turn west and then go through some darkness to the Gilwell Corner until you reach the Impisa Bar and then you step into the bright opening. That is the Brown Sea Terrace. That is to say the terrace outside the Commissioner's Club. Uh, I think that's all. And that is a room misspelling. I think London should be Mary Cash or the other way. But anyway, you will know your way. I don't. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alex. Uh, before I introduce the, uh, this morning's keynote speaker, I would like to invite my colleague Radha Stinger to take us through the program of the day.
Thank you, João, and good morning, everyone. My name is Radu Stinge. I am the Deputy Regional Director in the European Scout Office in Geneva, and I'm a member of the coordinating team in charge of the program. Obviously, I'm going to speak about the program. Thank you, John. <laughs> Today's program structure is very similar to that of yesterday. We begin this morning in plenary with a keynote address from Mr. Chris Lonsdale, an entrepreneur and business consultant who Joao will introduce shortly. After the morning coffee, we break in four parallel keynote sessions. And today's speakers are from the NGO sec sector, John May, Secretary General of the Duke of Edinburgh International Award and also Vice Chairman of the World Scout Committee, who will be speaking on what the outcomes of a good education should be in equipping young people for life. Our academic keynote today will be a joint presentation by Dr. Dato Thomas Chi and Dr. Atif Abdelmajid on their joint work in developing the success through scouting program. Professor K.P. Fung from the United College Chinese University in Hong Kong will speak about the long-standing partnership between the university and the Scout Association in Hong Kong in the area of accreditation of scouting adult leader training. And last but not least, we are joined by Ms. Laura Ritola, who will be presenting her PhD research on the forms and practices of citizenship education in Finnish scouting. Please note that the presentation of Dr. Dato Thomas Chi and Dr. Atif will be delivered in the Marrakesh room and not London, how it is written currently in your programs. Sessions will recommence at 15 hours. And you can see from the program during the afternoon, there is a wide range of seminar topics from you, for you to choose. Please note that there are also some NSA-led sessions that have been added to the program, which is not currently in your printed version, but they are on the website. There are leaflets on your chairs advertising the NSA-led sessions today. One of them from Ajeshi in Italy, talking about the theme of courage, and another one from Israel about the theme of coexistence as a part of a Messengers of Peace project. Please look on the website. You will see the sessions and register. Please sign up for your sessions before coffee break. We are going to print the list of participants between coffee break and lunchtime, and as yesterday, we're going to post them on the doors of the sessions. Please respect the fully booked sessions. As you have seen yesterday, the rooms are, have, have a limited capacity, and adding more people will not make the job of the facilitator easier. So please, if you want to attend the session, please sign up before so we know, and try to adapt the room for the number of the participants. This morning, you have, I believe you have all found on your chair four different colored chopsticks. This is Asia, an area of the world where gift giving is a very important aspect. The chopsticks are our gift to you. And what we ask is that you allocate to each of the chopsticks one message or one idea about how do you think or do you wish that scouting's education will be developed in the future? A strong message about the future of scouting. And you have the whole day to exchange your chopsticks and hopefully by the end of the day end up with two pairs of chopsticks of the same color. Use a coffee break and the informal time to talk to each other. So at the end of the day you have at least two new chopsticks with two new ideas from two new friends. And whenever we go home, you are going to eat Chinese food, which I'm sure is going to become more popular now. You would remember that your green stop chopstick comes from John May, who told you that youth empowerment is essential. Also on the 11th floor, you have a number of flip charts with some general ideas about the program asking you for feedback. Please use those. There's some post-its there where you can write uh, what you think about the program, how it impacted on you. So use that informal time as well to gather together around the flip charts, maybe discuss the topics and put some conclusions on the 
post-its and on the flip charts. Later this afternoon, we are going to transform the lobby downstairs into a market where delegations will have an opportunity to showcase program materials from, an, uh, from their NSOs, share the outcomes of recent or ongoing projects, and promote events. The day will conclude with the international evening, which is going to happen in this hall, Alexander? Yes. Thank you. We hope that you enjoy today's program very much. And now I hand up down to Joao to introduce our keynote address this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Radu. Before we uh, dive into the topic of the day, just to remind you, in case uh, it might be useful for your sessions, that you already have available on the uh, website of the Congress the results, uh, the main, the, well, the raw summary of the, um, the uh, results of the different sessions we had yesterday. So a very committed uh, team of uh, rapporteurs have worked during the evening and you can find uh, the main or the key uh, words and ideas that have been captured on the different sessions in case you want to see them today. Um, now in, let's go into uh, the topic of the day and to introduce our keynote speaker. Before that, just to clarify, you might have on your daily program um, a different speaker and as you probably know by now, uh, we were supposed to be joined today by uh, Mich Mrs. Shabana Bazish Razik, co-founder and president of the School of Leadership uh, in Afghanistan. But unfortunately, due to visa problems, at last minute she had to cancel. So we hope that we will be able to uh, have Shabana in another event uh, in the future. So we are extremely grateful to Chris Lonsdale for agreeing to fill in for Shabana this morning at short notice. Thank you, Chris. Born in New Zealand, Chris has worked for 20 years as a senior leadership advisor for multinationals and local companies in Asia. In his work with companies, Chris focused on the key traits, traits of great leadership, communication dynamics in senior teams, business strategy, and the skills that people need to succeed in business. Chris is also an entrepreneur in his own right. At present, he's running a growing startup business in China that has created an English language learning system for use on mobile devices. And it has a really interesting name, which is Kung Fu English. Before he began his advisory business, Chris was actively engaged in environmental protection and sustainability in Asia for almost 15 years. In 1989, he was part of the Ice Walk expedition to the North Pole which was used to raise global awareness in the issue of ozone depletion. He worked with the US Asia Environment Program to help create a series of programs in the Philippines that have been very successful and continue to run to this day. He set up and facilitated the first ever business environment workshop in Hong Kong and also designed and facilitated an action learning workshop on the environment for members of the Hong Kong Legislative Council. The title of Chris' keynote today is Future Proofing the World's Youth, Five Essential Skills to Last a Lifetime. Dear friends in scouting, please give a warm welcome to Mr. Chris Lonsdale. Can you hear me? Okay, good. Do we have the slides? We do? No, we do not. Good. Right. So, good morning, everybody. Good morning. I'm going to talk for, I don't know, roughly 30 minutes or so. And at the end, there will be time for Q&A. So I just wanted to give you a heads up. 
So if you think of a question as I'm going through, just feel free to, to make a note of it so you will remember it when you actually get the, the chance to ask the questions. When I was asked initially to, to do this presentation, I decided to spend some time reading up a little bit on the, the history of the scouting movement. And through that process, there's some really important highlights that stood out for me. The scouting movement was formed at a time in the world where there was a lot of change, there was a lot of uncertainty. And in many, many ways, that was almost the cause of why the movement was formed in the first place, when you look, look at the history and what Robert Baden-Powell was, was thinking at the time. If you look at what scouting is all about, and part of the focus of the, the education is it's on the moral development of young people. And in those days of change and uncertainty, young people needed a moral compass. And scouting really helped to provide that moral compass. And the other really important part of scouting is this whole idea of self-education and self-learning. And as Robert Baden-Powell said, that a, that a man, a person who knows how to learn by themselves, is set up for a successful life. So when you look at what was going on when scouting was formed, and you look at the world today, you see all sorts of very interesting parallels. And I think we can discover that the reasons for scouting that existed then exist today. And that scouting contributes in important ways because of those facts. Now, when you're educating young people in today's world, there's a massive question about what should you be teaching people? There is so much knowledge in the world. There is so much information. Where do you put your focus? In fact, there are more scientists alive today than the whole of the rest of history information and knowledge in the world is growing at an exponential rate. It is impossible for a human being to learn everything in their lifetime. So where do you put your attention? Because you can't do it all. And I like to use this idea of future proofing to help answer that question. Now if you've ever used software, then you will probably understand a little bit about this idea of future proofing. Years ago, I started using a piece of software called Claris Impact. And this is for generating slide presentations and it runs on the, the Macintosh. And it's a wonderful piece of software. It's intuitive. It has really sharp graphics. It's easy to use. And I created hundreds of presentations with this software. And then Apple decided to come out with a new operating system called OS X and Claris Impact stopped working. So I literally lost hundreds of presentations that are inaccessible because the operating system changed. So this future proofing happens when you're thinking about what's going to happen in the future, what are the possible pathways for the future, and you do your best to find things that are going to function well no matter what happens in the future. And it's the same thing with our young people today. We need to future proof the world's youth. And that means we need to help them develop essential skills that will be useful for them in all possible futures. It doesn't matter what the future holds, they're still going to be fine. So what is the world going to look like in 2030? Now, remember, that's only 17 years from now. Right, we're almost there. You know, that was a long time ago, 20 years ago. Now it's really close. When I was a kid, we had to do math with slide rules. Today, you do math on your phone. And this is actually a pocket computer that is much more powerful than all of the computers that we had 20 years ago. When I was a kid growing up in New Zealand, and I like to look at the past because it gives you a little bit of a sense of how the future can evolve based on how it's evolved in the past. You get a trajectory in mind. When I was a kid in New Zealand, New Zealand sold wool and meat to Britain. So essentially this was all being exported halfway around the world. Today, New Zealand sells kiwi fruit to China. So a completely different industry. 
completely different market, different language, everything has changed. And what most people don't know is that kiwi fruit actually originated from Anhui province in China. They're called mi hou tao, which is uh, uh, honey monkey fruit. And they got e exported to New Zealand 100 years ago. They got adapted and changed, and then New Zealand sold them back to China. 20 years ago, China was poor. Today, 25% of China's population is middle class. And that means they have a, an annual salary income of 10,000 US dollars or more, and there are something like 300 million Chinese people that make up this 25%, which means that the Chinese middle class is as large as the whole United States population. If you went to Shanghai in 1990 and looked across the Huangpu River from, from the Bund, you would have seen some agricultural land, some low-lying housing. In the 80s, there was nothing there. It was just fields. And this is Pudong today, just 20 years later. And there are 114 billionaires today in China. And China is one of the largest luxury markets on the planet. A fundamental shift. When I was in China in the 80s, when I first went there, like everyone thought China would stay like that for 100 years. Well, it didn't. So, <clears throat> that's the past. What are we looking at for the future? As you look ahead, you realize there are massive challenges. We still have world population that is growing exponentially, especially in Asia. A lot of growth in Africa and, and Latin America. We have deforestation happening in many, many places. Yesterday I was talking to uh, a lovely man from, from Tunisia who talked about some deforestation caused by fire in Tunisia and the community projects that, that scouts there are doing to, to plant. This deforestation leads to erosion and land loss, which fundamentally helps create some of the social problems and conflicts that we're seeing in all of the different regions in the world, leading to massive dislocations of people and multiple refugee crises all at the same time. Okay? Look in the news every day and you just see all of this stuff. But at the same time, there's so much hope and so much positive stuff going on. We have richer applications of technology. For instance, Google is now testing autonomous motor vehicles. These are cars that drive on the roads without a driver, just run by a computer. And the software that runs these cars is called Google Chauffeur. These cars have already done more than 300,000 miles on the roads in the United States. The state of Nevada, the state of Florida have both passed laws now allowing autonomous vehicles to run on the roads. So in 10 years time, it's very likely that we will be taking car rides with a computer driving the car for us. Taxi drivers will not necessarily have jobs anymore. The computers will be doing it. We might not even own these cars. The consensus seems to be that there will be a lease pool and you will just lease these cars for a week or a day or whatever you need and the computer will drive you around. That's going to fundamentally change the way the world operates in important ways. And today, already, you can buy one of these flying cars for a couple of hundred thousand US dollars. Terrafugia makes these. They're now researching cars that will be vertical takeoff, which will fundamentally change the, the whole transport system again, because you put the autonomous driver, which is the, the software together, with the ability for a car to fly, and you solve some of the, the problems of safety with cars flying around in the air. So who knows, 20, 30 years from now, we will have a transport system that's also up in the air. There's a whole new industry now that's coming up around 3D printing. A year ago, somebody did an experiment. They created a plastic gun that was printed on a 3D printer and it fired a bullet. However, it wasn't very stable for a long term and now there's a company that's come out called Solid Concepts and they are producing 3D drawings so a 3D printer can print a handgun in metal. Now, I'm definitely not an advocate for violence or war, but what's happening is that there's this localized manufacturing process that's beginning to happen. We're going to have manufacturing print shops on the street corner. If people in Hong Kong might remember years ago, the output centers in Hong Kong. 
where you would do some documents on your own computer and you would take a file on a floppy disk along to the output center and they'd print it for you. Well, what's going to happen is we're going to have yeah, a product that we want made. We're going to buy the drawing from somewhere around the world. We're going to take it down to the local print shop and they're going to print this product for us. So we're going to end up with a world with distributed manufacturing where you have mass customization where you can have whatever you want and it will be printed locally. Question. Who has seen the movie Avengers? Raise your hands. A few. Who has seen the movie Iron Man? Okay, Iron Man, good, good, okay. So you all know who Tony Stark is, right? Good. There's a company called Meta that has just come out with something called these space glasses. And you put them on and you can see a holographic 3D image that you can manipulate. You can work with it. So you want a vase. You create the vase by just using your hands and then you put that final drawing into the computer and you go to bed and you wake up in the morning and your 3D printer has printed your vase for you. They actually advertise this way. How does it work? You buy the glasses, connect your PC, download an app or you build your own and you are Tony Stark. <laughs> That's how they advertise it. So what you're seeing in these movies is actually already real today in the world. We have breakthrough materials and processes. Quantum computing is here already. Google has one. Ten years ago there was a lot of theory about what quantum computers would look like. Well, we now have them. And they do computation using the electronic state, the, the, the quantum state of atoms. And this means that Computers, these quantum computers can actually do parallel processing. Modern day computers, the ones that we have in our pockets, they do things in sequence. But these quantum computers can do it all in parallel, which means you can do massive calculations in a very short period of time. Calculations that would take a lifetime with your, your modern day PC can happen in minutes or hours. And not everyone's going to have one. You won't probably need one in your pocket, but if you're running a spaceship, then you need a way to navigate, and these quantum computers are going to help with that. We have graphene, which is a new miracle material that's come out. It's a single layer of carbon atoms structured as a hexagon, and it gives you all sorts of wonderful products. It's, it's, it conducts electricity, it's flexible, it's transparent. So what you see in this guy's hand is a tablet computer made of graphene. So the whole computer will be in the sheet. Samsung and other companies are already beginning to build products with graphene in them. Apple is researching wearable computing, things that you can actually wear. And then we have the biotech revolution that's happening. There's fundamental changes happening in this whole arena. For instance, all of the, knowing the human genome now, we have a lot of information about mutations. And you may or may not know that, but Angelina Jolie's mother died of, of breast cancer. And so Angelina Jolie went and got a test done which showed that she had the mutation for breast cancer. And she had a greater than 80% chance of dying from breast cancer by the time she was 50. So she decided to have an operation and, and uh, a double mastectomy. And now she only has a 5% or less chance of getting, of getting any form of cancer and dying. So we're going to see increasing numbers of tests that use genetic information. We're going to see drugs directly targeted very, very specifically to certain situations. And I don't know, who, who, who knows what a telomere is? Okay, a few people, okay. Telomeres are like the, the ends of your shoelaces, that little plastic thing that stops the shoelace from fraying, but they're on the end of your chromosomes. And as we get older, our telomeres get shorter, and then our chromosomes start to fray. And that is one of the reasons why we have aging diseases. Well, the, an enzyme in the body called telomerase but you can also take it as a nutraceutical and it causes the telomeres to grow back again. So you can literally slow down or prevent aging by these sorts of technologies and this is only the beginning. Today there are companies already selling nutraceuticals that help build your telomeres back. It's the beginning of, you know, everyone in this room now probably has the chance of living way beyond 100 and being healthy, fit and happy throughout that whole time. So we have an uncertain future ahead of us. 
There's so much, so much happening, nobody can say with any specificity exactly what will happen. You can say for sure it's going to be interesting. You can say for sure it's going to be very different to today, but the specifics of it we don't know. So within that context, who is this future human? Who is this young person growing up, going into the workforce? What do they need to know? What do they need to be able to do? Actually, it's quite a simple thing to answer. There are five essential capabilities that people need to have to learn. If you look at work in the past, it was dirty, it was repetitive, it was monotonous. Today, the future of work is automation in many, many ways. Okay, all of that dirty, hard, difficult work we use machines to do. So what do you need people for? You need people to do creative problem solving. The machines can't do that. A very simple business problem, let me share with you. You're doing an e-commerce business, you have a website, you want to increase visits to your website so that you can get more sales. And therefore you have a question which is how do you get them on to, to your, your website. You actually can do things like put videos on the video sites. But uh, based on what Facebook have said, uh, the guy who, who literally is paid to view videos on Facebook, his, his, his statistic is that there are 48 hours of new video uploaded to Facebook every minute. So how do you stand out? How do you get seen? And that is a question that people on the front line in your business need to be struggling with and coming up with answers to. So you need brains and hands. You need people who can think through problems, come up with the solutions, and then execute them. When I hire people, I tell them, I don't want you to be following my instructions to go do things. I want you to tell me what we should be doing and have your own plan in place so that you can then execute it. And that's, as a business person, what I want from, from the people in my team. The second skill is people need to be self-directed learners and it needs to be lifelong. Let me ask in this room, the stuff that you learned in college, is it all useful for, for you today or is a lot of it passe, it's gone, it's no longer valid? Knowledge is growing so quickly, there's no way you can learn it all in college. So you have to be able to continually learn throughout your whole life in order to keep up with what's important. And you do that on the job, you do that through the work that you do. First of all, you recognize that you have a problem, you start looking for resources. You need to be able to go to the internet, to libraries, whatever, pull all of this information together. You need to be able to assess what information is actually useful, what is not useful. And then you take what is useful and you put it into a test project. So essentially what you're doing is experimenting. And based on your experiments, you learn and then you have a project that can turn into a real product or a real service of some sort. So basically you're taking data, looking at what happened, learning something from the process and doing it again, which in another word is called learn by doing. And I know that in the scouting, learning by doing is a key idea, a key concept. What is interesting is this is also the scientific method. You have a hypothesis, you do experiments, you get results, you get your conclusions. So science is learning by doing, scouting is learning by doing. The third skill is confidence and self-belief. If you're not confident, if you don't have self-belief, you don't dare to learn by yourself because you're looking for someone to validate what you're learning. You don't dare to do creative problem solving because you want someone to tell you what's right and what's wrong. So you need confidence and self-belief. And one of the best ways to get confidence and self-belief is to have physical challenges that you succeed at. To be comfortable in your body. To know that you can abseil, that you can white water raft, that you can, you can put up tents and you can survive in the winter outside if you need to. It gives incredible self-confidence to people. The fourth skill is communication. Very, very, very important in business. When you run an e-commerce website, this is the last thing you want to see on a Monday morning. I came into work one morning, a few months ago. This is what I saw. Our IT guy had taken some initiative. He discovered that we needed a new app on the website and that the website OS required the latest version to run that app. So he up graded the OS on the, the production server. However, all the other apps didn't work under the new operating system. 
and it took the website down for a week. Okay, so yes, he was being, taking initiative, but he wasn't communicating. He didn't talk to me. He didn't talk to the director of operations. He didn't talk to anybody. He just thought it was a good idea. So communication is absolutely key. Years ago, I was brought into an insurance company in Hong Kong to, uh, to do an assignment, and they, the brief they gave me was to help make them to be more innovative. They said, we're not innovative enough. We need to be more innovative. So I thought, okay, this is interesting. Let me go find out what's really happening. So I interviewed people all around the company, and I found that they had too much innovation. And everyone's going, how come they have too much? Surely they didn't have enough. No, no. They were in silos. They were not talking to each other. Every department was innovating like crazy, but no other departments knew what they were doing. So nothing got used throughout the whole organization because of the lack of communication. Absolutely critical. In a different situation, I was asked to come in and coach the son of the founder of a very successful SME in Hong Kong. And again, on the surface, the problem was the son can't lead. Well, I got into this and I sat in on some of their meetings and you had people rolling their eyes, people crossing their arms, there was a lot of talking, a lot of noise and no communication. Fundamentally, the communication in that company was highly dysfunctional, and I can assure you that dysfunctional communication in a business, especially at the senior level, will kill the business. Absolutely. So everybody who's going into business to be successful needs to know how to communicate and needs to understand communication dynamics at the group level. So there's two parts to this. It's not just you know how to talk or present, but you actually get what happens in groups when groups are communicating. And the fifth skill is emotional intelligence. Compassion, tolerance, all those things are part of it. This was some research done in Dubai looking at EQ, which is emotional intelligence on the left, and performance on the, on the, uh, the x-axis at the bottom. And as you can see, the higher EQ is correlated with uh, much better performance. In this particular example, you had a control group, which is the, the pink ones and the blue group, which were trained in EQ. And this is salespeople. So it's looking at what happens to sales performance with people who have EQ versus people who don't. And it's very, very obvious. There's a major, major improvement in the ability to generate revenue when you actually have higher EQ. And there are five components of EQ for just as a reviewer for people. First of all, self-awareness. If you don't have any awareness about yourself, what's going on with yourself, how you're feeling, how you're responding, how other people might see you, then you have a problem. You need to have self-regulation, which means you cannot afford to be highly emotional in an irregular way with anger bursts for small issues. Because if you look at businesses where this happens, it's highly destructive. It's destructive to the business, it's destructive to the career of the person who is behaving this way. And very, very often, it's not that someone wants to behave this way, but they, they can't self-regulate. So this capacity to, to regulate your own emotional state and to literally behave in a, in a more even and smooth manner is very, very important. As is internal motivation. You have a goal, you have things you want to achieve, and you just stay with it, even in the face of disappointment, in the face of failure, in the face of people saying you're stupid. Okay? You continue to move ahead with the goals that you've set for yourself. That is one of the hallmarks of a successful life. You can then achieve things in the face of diversity. Uh, not diversity, uh, barriers, sorry. I, I speak too much Chinese, I forget my English sometimes. Empathy is, the, is another one, absolutely key. You need to be able to sense what is happening with other people around you and respond appropriately. And then social skills, networking, teamwork skills, all of that is key. It's all part of this EQ package. So those are the five core skills. Creative problem solving, self-directed learning, confidence and self-belief, good communication, and emotional intelligence. So how do young people learn these things? This is a key question. Well, when you look around, you discover that the formal education system, in general, does not help. 
The Graduate Management Admission Council looked at MBAs and found that 14% of them are unemployed. So go figure. People spend a lot of money to get an MBA degree, but businesses don't want to hire them. Why? Fundamentally, they don't add value. As a business person who's looking for people who can do creative problem solving, who have business sense, very often graduates from MBA programs have neither of those things. So they're not useful to you. This is a graph showing the black line is the salaries that bachelor's degrees graduates get. And the orange line, or red line, whatever it looks like to you, is the cost of getting that degree. So again, the cost of getting the degrees is going up, but the money you get once you join the workforce is going down. Why? Again, because business is not seeing the value of it. And I can assure you that if a person is truly adding value to your business, you're going to want to keep them and you're going to want to pay them well because they're helping you deliver value to your customers which your customers will pay for. It's a really simple equation. But if they're not adding that value, you don't really have a hope. Which brings me to the Ivy League mistake. I had a small investment in a company about nine years ago that was uh, focused on international business but had its major operations set up in Beijing in China. And the CEO believed that bringing in graduates from Ivy League colleges would actually help to make the business very successful. Well, he couldn't have been more wrong because the Ivy League graduates were all thinking big picture, consulting type thinking, you know, when it's in a perfect world with all of the perfect systems set up, what would this look like? Well, anyone who's done a startup knows that that's not how it works. You have an idea, you do an experiment, the market gives you feedback, you realize that your idea was half right, you change a lot of things, and you need to iterate your way into a successful business model. And these people were unable to do that to the point where even when the company had a product, a service that it could sell, they didn't have payment gateways set up, so the company had no way to receive money from customers, which, if you have business sense, you know is completely nuts. One of the first things you need to do is find a way to have transactions. And everyone was so focused on this perfect world that was maybe 10 years away that they didn't do the practical things right today that needed to be done to make the business survive. And the result was this company burned through 3 million US dollars and got zero return. Nothing. The other day I came across what can only be called a horror story. A woman in Hong Kong, a British woman with a seven-year-old son, had to take him out of school because he was having violent, aggressive outbursts in the classroom. And before she took him out, she actually went and sat in on the class. And what was happening was the kids were like raising their hands, trying to ask intelligent questions, and the teacher was saying, shut up, you're supposed to be listening to me, you have no authority or right to ask me questions, just do as you're told. These are little kids that were being given piles of homework that they had to complete every day. And if they didn't complete it, they were put in the punishment room in, at the school. So this little seven-year-old boy, a creative little boy who wants to set up his own YouTube videos to teach other kids to speak Cantonese, this is a little Brit kid, okay? He was just going nuts in this classroom, so he was losing it. Other kids weren't so lucky. They were just sort of doing this, going to sleep. This is not every classroom in the world. However, in Hong Kong, I know this happens a lot. It's happening in a lot of different countries. In the US now, there's all this focus on teaching to the test. And this all creates problems. So the traditional way of doing education doesn't work, especially when it's done really badly. So what does work? Well, we know from decades of research in, into psychology, into learning, into memory, what works. I'm going to share with you four words, meaning, relevance, attention, and memory, and these four words interact in very important ways when it comes to learning. Come with me for a walk. You're walking through a forest, and you notice a tree with some marks on it, and maybe you pay attention, maybe you don't. 
You go another 100 meters and you see a mark like this in the mud. Maybe you pay attention. Maybe you don't. And if you don't, then you're going to pay attention. <laughs> because you just learned that that actually means that. And any information that helps your survival has relevance. If it's relevant, you pay attention. And if you pay attention, you will learn, you will remember. One time is enough. Any information that it helps you to achieve your personal goals has relevance. If it's relevant, you pay attention. If you pay attention, you remember, you learn. Very simple. So the first principle is kids, anybody, us. Yeah, learning a language is the same thing. Focus on content that's relevant to you. That's it. It then has meaning for you. You pay attention. You learn. Tools are part of this. We master tools by using tools. And we learn tools fastest when they are relevant. True story. A keyboard is a tool. A method of typing Chinese is a tool. Many years ago in Hong Kong, uh, one of my assistants would go to night school on a Tuesday night and a Thursday night to learn how to type in Chinese. She was Chinese, by the way, so she spoke the language. And she would spend two hours on Tuesday and two hours on Thursday, and she would practice at home. And after nine months, do you think she could type Chinese? No. And one night we had a crisis. We had to deliver a 50-page training manual in Chinese to a client in two days, 48 hours and she got the job. I can tell you, she learned to type Chinese in two days. Literally. Why? Because it suddenly became relevant. She paid attention. She learned. When she couldn't remember how to type a character, she looked it up in the book. By the third time this, this happened, her brain was going, this is nuts. It's taking too much time. Remember it. And so she remembered it. That's what happened. Very simple. Two days. So the second principle is use tools that help you to achieve your personal goals. So a young person wants freedom, wants to have friends, wants to get out. So they're probably going to want to learn to drive. Okay? It's relevant for them. It's a tool they can use. They're going to learn quickly. So in scouting, when you're working with young people, you just need to find tools that align with the goals of the young people and help the young people get a little bit clear on what their goals might be. And it can be a six-month goal. It can be a two-week goal. It doesn't matter. It just has to be something that they think is important for them, and you give them some tools to work with to achieve that goal, and voila, you have an outcome. The third element is full sensory engagement, where you're seeing it, you're hearing it, you're feeling it. Your full body, your neurological system is engaged totally. Many years ago, I took a friend to New Zealand, and we went up to Mount Cook area and one of the glaciers, and we were... Yeah, and he didn't know what a glacier was. He'd studied it in school and stuff, but you said, well, yeah, what's a glacier? He couldn't tell you. He had no idea. He'd heard the word, sort of. And we're standing there, and he, we hear this sound. <coughs> and he goes, what's that? I said, no, that's the glacier you're standing on. And he bent down and he felt the ice and he saw all the moraine, the rocks on top of the glacier and he saw the U-shaped valley and aha, so that's the glacier. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's the glacier. Okay, he got it. He could see it, he could hear it, he could feel it. You know, which is why when you learn how to make a fire, you can hear it, you can smell it. You have the feelings in your hands from doing it. You remember it. It becomes part of who you are because your whole nervous system is involved in this process of learning. And stories and metaphors are a fantastic part of this. I was talking to Peter Illig last night, and he was saying to me that he loved the story times around the fire and scouting. That was the most fun part. And it's fun because you get your whole body involved. You, you, your imagination is, is involved. You're fully engaged in this process of storytelling, which is part of the human condition going back as far as we can remember. Telling stories around a fire, it's part of who we are as a species. And it works. We connect to that stuff, and our whole mind and body is involved as part of it. 
The fourth principle is reflection. This is absolutely key. You talk about learning by doing, but it works much, much, much better when you add reflection into it. So you take an action, you get a result, you reflect on why it tastes so bad. And you learn something, and you do it again. So it doesn't matter what you're learning, you've got to stop and reflect on what you did, what happened, and why. And that's how you learn. And the fifth principle is your psychophysiological state. If you're angry, if you're upset, if you're hurting, if you're fearful, you will not learn. Anybody who's studied really hard for an exam and then gone to do the exam, their brain has frozen up, understands this. Our brain doesn't work when we're frightened. We can't learn when we're frightened. If you're comfortable, if you're happy, if you're relaxed, if you're curious, you're going to learn. Which is why something that Karen, Karen Jair said yesterday was really, really, really important. There are so many people, especially poor people in the world, who are in fear. And because they're in fear, they can't learn. Because they can't learn, they can't even find a way to get out of their own problem. So people, young people around the world, first of all, have to learn how to manage their own state, no matter what is happening. Secondly, if you're running groups, organizations, as a leader, you need to find ways to make it safe for people so they are comfortable, they're happy, they're relaxed, they have an opportunity to be curious. And that's going to help them learn. It's going to help everybody grow. So these are the five principles of rapid learning. Relevance, learning by using tools, having multi-sensory input, using self-reflection as a key component, and state management. That's absolutely essential. And I'm assuming, I'm guessing, that there's lots of people around the world who are thinking about this new future with quantum computing and biotechnology and flying cars and wondering... Wow, scouting's pretty old. Is it still relevant? And the answer is simply yes, of course it's relevant. Just because something's old does not make it irrelevant. If you have ever burned your most favorite photos onto a CD and gone back two years later to look at the photos and discovered that they're corrupted because the CD medium broke down, you will understand what I mean. I never keep photos on a CD, ever. <laughs> I have multiple stacks of hard drives that are running all the time. That's how I store my stuff. Okay. So parchment lasts hundreds of years. And for transmitting written information over a long period of time, it's a much, much better me medium than data. Right? So just because something's old doesn't mean it's, it's passe. Sometimes old stuff is better fit for, for what you want it to do than some of the new stuff. More fundamentally, think about scouting, where it came from. A changing world with lots of uncertainty. And scouting came about partly to teach skills to young people, to be able to manage that change and uncertainty, to be able to survive and prosper and contribute in the midst of all of that change and uncertainty. The world continues to change. The uncertainty continues to be here. Those skills are as valid, those tools are as valid today as they always were. And think at an even more fundamental level. This is really important. The ability to have creative problem solving, to learn by yourself, to be confident, to communicate, to have emotional intelligence, that has always been valuable. A hundred years ago, somebody with all of those things was highly valued, highly valuable, could contribute enormously in society. That is true today, in business and everywhere, and it will be true a hundred years from now. Also, having ways to help the human brain learn quickly, easily, and effectively has always been relevant. And think about it. The scouting movement identified these principles and then put them into practice in the real world for millions and millions of people. I heard a number this morning, something like, there, in today's world, there are 500 million people who have been scouts at some time. So the scouting movement got these principles and applied them, didn't maybe have the scientific terminology for it, but it worked. So, 
the scouting movement is as relevant today as it ever has been. And it will be very, very relevant for the future because it centers around what the world really needs and what the human brain really needs in order to learn easily, effectively, and for the long term. Thank you. Happy to take questions. Or is everybody too shell-shocked? Chris, uh, good morning. My name is Neville Tompkins. Hey, I'm Neville. the International Commissioner for Scouts Australia. Uh, thank you very much indeed for an excellent presentation. I'm very reassured by your comment that scouting has fundamentals and values that are directly relevant to the future. We learned yesterday about the changing needs of our, of our young people. If we want to be relevant in 10, 15, 20 years time. What do we need to do today to meet those future needs? You acknowledge that the fundamentals are right, but what do we need to do within the organisation to help the young people okay. in 10, 15 years time? Okay, well, I don't know enough about the specifics of the organisation um, and the culture and what happens to, to speak knowledgeably about that. However, I would say, for instance, you take this principle of knowing how to learn by yourself, okay? So if a young person has been taught to understand there's a problem and then to find the resources to solve it and to learn through that process, then it doesn't matter what happens in 15, 20 years because that person is going to grow up solving problems their whole life and learning by themselves their whole life. They're going to go, hmm, never seen that before. Okay, what do I do? Well, the first thing I do is go and find people who maybe have seen it before. And then they go, hang on a minute, nobody's ever seen this before. What do they do? They get curious. And they start looking at what's really going on and they start really observing. And they, they try to really become very scientific in going through the steps of understanding what they're facing. So just with that, it, you, you, can't, you can't predict everything they're ever going to need. All you can do is set them up with the skills to, to meet it head on when, when they face it. And I think the, the ideal metaphor is for parenting. The parent is the bowman and the child is the arrow. And the minute that arrow leaves the bow, there's nothing you can do about it. It's on its own. Okay? So all you can do is aim properly and release well. And I think those five principles, especially the ability to, to learn by yourself and the confidence and the ability to communicate, right? If a kid has got all those, I can tell you, they will solve any problem in their whole life. And the rest is detail. And the detail keeps changing, which is why you can't manage it. Does that answer the question? Yeah, okay. There's a, there's a hand up here. Mike Runner. <laughs> thank you. Chris, uh, thank you for the presentation, inspiring presentation. Um, you were saying that one of the uh, things for, f for learning is that you need to engage all your senses. Yes. Um, my question is, in this current world in which especially young people are... Um, stimulated by a number of things happening at the same time, especially on communication area, being connected all the time in all this. Do you find it difficult to have this full engagement of senses in this learning process? <laughs> this is just it, you see. The, what, the reason why they're doing that all the time is because their senses are fully engaged. Right, they're hearing it, they're seeing it, right? 
it's relevant for them. They're communicating with their friends. They're competing with their friends. They have challenges that they continually overcome. It's highly relevant for them at this stage in their development, and it's highly addictive because of its relevance. Okay, I used to play computer games. I would do all-nighters on computer games because I had to solve these problems. And I tell you, it's really interesting because you're learning about physics. You're learning about physics. Uh, I don't know if anyone has come across a woman called Vi Hart, V-I-H-A-R-T. Has anyone heard of this woman? If you have, raise your hands. Okay, one person down the back, okay. I have a 12-year-old daughter, right? And she loves Vi Hart. Vi Hart teaches kids how to doodle in math class. Okay, she teaches kids how to doodle in math class. But she's teaching fractal mathematics. She's teaching high-level mathematics through drawing and paper folding. And it's absolutely fabulous. It's absolutely fabulous. And kids just are totally drawn into this because it's so well done. Okay? So if you're involved in getting young people excited and interested, guess what? You have to get creative. You have to perform. And you have to let them get creative and let them perform because they're most interested in what their friends are doing. And they learn from each other in really important ways and they get into it even as young people. And all you need to do sometimes is set up a context, maybe have a project that is meaningful to these people and step out of the way. Let them do it. A number of years ago, I had to do a program at City University of Hong Kong and we, I worked with one of the professors, Dr. Barbara Gorajska, and she was running a course called Human Computer Interface Design. And we completely reorganized the course. We did a couple of things. When everyone came in, you know, these, these kids all came in for, for the first lecture, a couple of hundred of them, and they sat down and they looked really bored. And we said to them, you're not going to learn easily and quickly until the worst has happened. And they went, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then we gave them the final exam, day one of the course. And we failed them all. And we said, OK, your grade will depend on how much you improve from here. We made it very relevant for them. And then we did things like we, we did a simulation of having a conversation with a computer. And we never taught these kids how to do presentations. We never taught them how to do PowerPoints or anything. But I tell you, when it came time for their final presentation, these kids did professional presentations that were 10 times better than any business presentation that I had seen by that time. They did a fabulous job. And it was simply because they were challenged, they had a goal, they observed what worked, and they went and did it. You didn't have to do anything else. You just had to be the message quite often. Does that help answer the question? Yeah. Mike Runner. Where's the mic? I will focus my questions on those who are only relevant to scouting, on two matters, focus and relevance. Mm -hmm. Of course, I belong to the dinosaur age. Who gives the focus and who decides the relevance? If it is for the scouts, the youth, to decide the focus, they may focus on the Facebook. They may focus on leisure readings. And they think they are relevant to scouting because of the Twitter and the Facebook. And now online, on all the inspiring talks on you. Should we go back to the old age that a scout master like the parenting that should decide the focus? That is the aiming on the bow and arrow and release them when they grow up. They have their focus and they feel what is the relevance. 100 years ago, when Baden Powell created scouting, he has the theme cupping for fun, scouting for boys. Look why for senior scouts and they're rovering to success with a moral background. I found the scouting in the last 20 years 
since Bangkok on youth powering and youth enhancement. It's simply let them follow the modern trend to face the uncertainty by relying on their own focus rather than as a guardian that this movement provide them with the education value based on the value of scouting. I don't know whether my emphasis on this theory of the dinosaur age is still relevant in the 20 years ahead of us. Okay, um, that's actually a very, I think it's a very profound question. Um, and I think I would answer it first of all very simply by saying scouting was Baden-Powell's Facebook. Okay? He went and did something new that hadn't been done. He created something that kids could go do by themselves. And scout groups were being set up autonomously by young people with no adults directing them. He gave them a vision of adventure, of play, of becoming military men and doing really cool things in the wilderness. And these kids got together by themselves and they went and did it. It didn't need the adults. So that's why I say in, in some way you could say that scouting was in fact Baden-Powell's Facebook. Right? You cannot force other people to accept what you think is relevant. You cannot, it's like Obamacare in America, right? You will use this health provider because we the government say so. No, in, in a free market economy, you, can't, you find out what people really need and then you design a product or service and you deliver it to them. And if they like it, they'll pay you lots of money. And if they don't, they will pay you nothing and you go out of business and you deserved to go out of business because you didn't listen. So as adults, part of what you need to be doing is really getting in and sensing what is really important for the kids. And then through that process of dialoguing with them, you sit down and you get yourself at the same level as them and really feel what they're communicating and listen to what they're saying, you can then gently guide them to a discovery and exploration of the scouting way. And if it's true to core principles, I guarantee the kids are going to know it. They're going to go, this is cool. I want to go abseiling. I want to learn how to to climb ropes. I want to learn how to, to raft down a river because that's exciting and fun. And you also mentioned one other thing. They do a lot of reading, stories. Okay, language learning. I do a lot of work in language learning. Let me say thing, something very, very important here. The one thing that leads to high levels of language capacity in your first language or a second language or anything is voluntary free reading. You read what you like and you enjoy the process and you will become highly fluent in a language. Learning grammar doesn't work. Doing tests doesn't work. Preparing for tests doesn't work. Reading what you like builds high level language skills. And when you read what you like, you come across all sorts of interesting ideas. I grew up on science fiction. I loved it. I spent hours reading science fiction. And I learned so much about communication, about science, about creativity from science fiction. I loved Monty Python. Who knows Monty Python? Okay. I have a theory. I have a theory. <coughs> this theory is my... I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> I have a theory that in our modern age, our ability to think outside of the box and go have completely wacky, interesting ideas comes from Monty Python. They, they literally, we were growing up being challenged to go, you know, everyone's looking at it like this. Hmm. What happens if we look at it like this? And we get a whole new perspective. And I think that comes from, from Monty Python in many ways. A whole generation growing up on this wacky humor, which is really all about changing perspective. And as kids, we used to go around taking on the, the characters of Monty Python shows. Right, that was our Facebook. Okay, so you can't control it. It's natural, it's powerful. It's 
like the weather. You sort of point it sort of in a direction, get out of the way, and be there to guide when asked, is my view. Thank you for your presentation. And we have received um, questions from online, which is from the Robin, from sorry, sorry, from the IBIS International Commissioner FOS Scouting Belgium, and he asked if we go for the self-learning approach, we don't go too much to a pragmatic approach all the time, and lose the more and lose the more scientific approach that make everything in the consideration. So he asked your opinion of this. Thank you. All right. Um, again, let me answer it this way. You cannot stop people learning. People learn anyway. You learn your way home from the pub by walking home from the pub. <laughs> you might need to be drunk next time because of state-dependent memory in order to find your way again, but... <laughs> All right, so self-learning is a given. People learn by themselves anyway. We just need to get out of the way. And as part of that, let me ask a question. In this room, who has seen a stupid baby? If you have ever seen a stupid baby, raise your hands. <laughs> okay. Who has seen a stupid 10-year-old? If you've seen a you know, really just incompetent, stupid 10-year-old, raise your hands. Okay. Who has seen a stupid 20-year-old? Who has soon seen a stupid 50-year-old? <laughs> what is wrong with this picture? Okay, they start perfect, we spend 20 years messing them up. Okay, that is the crux. And when it comes back to the second part of that question, which was about science, let me say it in black and white. The scouting movement is scientific. Scouts might not have known about neurophysiology and everything that we know today about how the brain works and how people learn, but fundamentally, Baden Powell went, hmm, kids learn this way really well, they learn that way really badly, let's do this. That's scientific. It works. You might not know why it works, but it works. Who in this room understands why electricity works? <laughs> About five people. Do the rest of you care? <laughs> I think I made my point. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Good morning. Much has been said about scouting, its rich history, its fundamentals, its principles. And you said that we are as much relevant as before and now and into the future. My question is, what do you believe or who do you believe should be the kind of leaders that should continue to move this movement into the future? Wow. Thank you. Okay. Adults who are deeply compassionate and humble who realize they know very little about anything and who are always curious. Okay. Um, I just want to have a comment on the self-education, but uh, I just want to remind everyone, I think in scouting, we also have an uh, edu uh, educational objective. 
the final education goal for our, the, the edu uh, scouting program we provided in each NSO. So we still to think about this educational goal. Then we allow the uh, scouts to do some self-learning, but it's still with some guidance because we have the ultimate goal about the final education uh, objective for that. For we want to uh, train our young people to become a responsible citizen, but you still have to decide according to your uh, country's the, uh, the situation, maybe some political, economical, education, or whatever cultural reason in your country, then you have to decide what's your obje uh, educational objectives. Then you will create your program, you present the program to your young people. Then you allow young people to have self-learning by themselves with the guidance of uh, adults. So this is a comment I want to make. Thank you. Okay. Let me, let, let, let me just comment to that very briefly. If you have educational objectives and you set up a program based on it and you invite the young people to come and participate in that and they stay and they're happy and they love it, it's probably working. If they decide they don't want to come, it's not working. Your product failed. Again, that's a business view. But seriously, if, if what you're doing is working, you'll have customers. And if what you're doing is not working, you won't. Okay? And you can't then come in and dictate the outcome. That's what governments do. And governments don't work very well. Because they're dictating outcomes that the people don't want, and so it becomes a real mess. Okay, so we want to get away from people in authority telling everyone what they should do, and you start listening a lot more, and it becomes much more organic as a system. And if it's working, then people will come to you. There's another question. I see the hand down there. You, just to, let me complete this loop here, and then the next mic over here. Uh, no, sir, I, I would like to say uh, to your answer that I think uh, if, uh, if according to Baden Powell, he also asked for the boys. I think there's still a, a dialogue going on within our organization mm. uh, for the leaders of adults in the association. We're still seeking for the uh, dialogue with the young people. So this is why we have some question about what's the uh, explanation or needs of young people. We need to communicate with them. So it's not uh, just uh, we create something. There's still a dialogue. We, yeah, I think you have to. Um, I, actually, I don't know your background, but uh, for us, we've been scouting for many years. We know the ideas or some of that. Uh, it's not a, uh, it's not an uh, offense to you, but uh, I think, uh, yeah, I just want to express that uh, there's, uh, it's. Yeah, you see, we just adults here for this Congress, but still back to our countries, we have some youth forum, we have youth program, youth participation, etc. So I think it's going on and on. It's not just to say, oh, we create something, and this is we want young people to follow us. Yeah, I think Baden Powell still, we ask for the boys. Thank you. Okay, and, and, and my, just, just to finally say something on that, when when you're actually correct in your position and, and the stuff that you're sharing, young people understand that actually it has real value and they'll listen. There was a question over here. Yeah. Uh, good day. Uh, my name is Sanda, International Commissioner for Madagascar. My question is concerning um, what will be the adjustment. Uh, when I saw your figure uh, during the past and the future, on the past, we have a lot of fields, we have a lot of forests, and uh, right now we have a deforestation, a lot of uh, uh, building progress and something like that. So, no nature. On part of our scout methods, we are part of the law, the one promise, learning by doing, patrol system, etc., and nature. In 20 years time, 30 years time, we don't know. Nature can we, maybe we don't have uh, forests in certain parts of the world. Do you think people or kids or youth who are living in this part of the world remain happy, get uh, more improvement? What would be the requirement or adjustments concerning uh, what is it, um, the future with uh, deforestation? This is my question. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Wow. Um, 
There's a movie come out recently uh, with Will Smith and his son. It's called After Earth. Has anyone seen it? Okay, a few people have seen it. The backstory to it is that humanity has to leave planet Earth and go to another planet in another star system. And the reason is that the Earth starts treating humanity as an invasive species and has an immune system response. So the whole planet says, you know what? People are bad news, it's a disease, let's get rid of them. Uh, and I think fundamentally, if we do not change how our relationship with the biosphere of which we are a part, we are doomed as a species. And it might not be 50 years, it might be a little bit longer, but we cannot continue to use straight line thinking, destroying the planet that literally is our life support system. Okay. Secondly, I think at a fundamental level, human beings connect in important ways with nature. And I'll just share a story, and I think time's almost up, right? Um, when I went to, to the North Pole on the ice walk expedition, it was very interesting. There was a student from Hong Kong as part of that expedition. And we uh, were at a weather station, and there'd been a, a couple of hours training in the afternoon on how to use a sextant to navigate. And it was midnight, and he was sitting in the canteen, and he was listening to the tape recording he had made of the lecture. And I said to him, okay, how many times have you listened to this? He said, seven. I said, do you understand it any better now than when you started listening? He said, no. Then I asked him a really profound question. I said, where is the sun right now? Where is the sun? And remember, this is in the Arctic. We were already in 24-hour daylight. Okay, so the sun was somewhere. It was either there or there or somewhere. So I said, where is the sun? He did not know. And I, I realized then a really important thing had happened. He grew up in Hong Kong. He grew up in Hong Kong in concrete canyons. Tall buildings here, tall buildings here. You never see the sun. You don't know where the sun is. You don't know the sun goes around the sky. So what happens is we have young people growing up now with no connection to the natural world. They do not understand natural principles. They do not understand the cycles of life. And this leads to a mind that is incapable of understanding what we need to do to make our world healthy and balanced. And the fact that scouting takes people into the natural world and you learn about the natural world and the cycles of natural life is absolutely essential to helping the human brains of our young people understand fundamental principles of life and death on this planet. Because if we don't get that, then we get death. And that is fundamental. Okay. okay. I'm fine. So, uh, well, I hope you feel half inspired as I am now. <laughs> Thank you, Grace. Please, a big round of applause.